this is the Wed Web Chat, and I'm Kanan Chandran, the publisher of StormAsia.com. The Wed Web Chat is in its 90th uh, episode today. So it's been a wonderful run where we've learned a lot, where well, I've learned a lot, and those who've been watching have probably also had the opportunity to, to interact with different sorts of people and get a sense of what's taking place in the world and what's shaping the world we're living in. Today's session, it's, uh, it's about something which a lot of people uh, <clears throat> find very disconcerting, privacy. I think there's so much information flowing. Uh, many of us live our lives in the digital world. So how can you safeguard your privacy as an individual or a corporation uh, when there's just so much of information out there and there's going to be even more down the line? Uh, privacy has changed dramatically over the, the decades. It's been shaped by uh, technological advances, uh, cultural shifts, uh, legal developments, and geopolitical factors. We've got uh, panelists today who are well-versed in various aspects of, the, of this uh, industry and what it has to offer. Um, we've got uh, Tommy Ting, who is a senior regional pre-sales engineer at Asset. Uh, Tommy is a cybersecurity specialist with extensive experience in the field. He has a strong background in various security solutions, including endpoint security and endpoint detection and response, uh, and coupled with a deep understanding of emerging technologies and threat landscapes. Uh, Dominic Forrest is a chief technology officer at iProve. Um, Dominic has more than 25 years of experience in senior, sale, uh, senior roles in telecommunication companies and internet service providers. He's responsible for iProve's uh, technology vision strategy and roadmap, which includes the design and development of its cloud-based infrastructure. Guy Hearn, who calls himself an agent of change, uh, is, he's with Virtus Asia Consulting, and uh, Guy is a 25-year insights, media, measurement, and strategy professional. He's based in Singapore since 2005. He has worked with uh, multinational blue chips, through to innovative startups across multiple categories throughout the region. Okay, I'd like to start uh, with a simple question, which hopefully has a more complex uh, answer. What does privacy mean to you? Uh, let's start with you, Dominic. That's a really good question, actually. And I, I strongly suspect we're going to get very, very different answers. If you ask 10 people, you'll probably get 10 different answers. For me, privacy is about knowing what is happening to me and who's got access to things I consider private. So if I come at this from a data perspective, you know, I put my uh, face on my LinkedIn profile because I want people to be able to see it. I expect that to be used for the purposes of LinkedIn. I don't expect to be walking down the street in and have that, fake, that image which has been scraped from there used by a company to be to match me and find my face and recognize who I am, whether it's to target me for advertising or something else. So it really is about knowledge and control of your data, controlling who has access to it and understanding what it can be used for. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes a bit spooky if I sit here and I'm Googling something, maybe I'm trying to buy a present for my wife and she maybe opens up one of the platforms and suddenly sees adverts for what it is I might have been trying to buy her. You know, joining that together is sometimes a bit disconcerting. If I know what's being done to my data and feel in control of it, then to me, that's what privacy is. Having unexpected side consequences or having unexpected things happen to me, that's when, for me at least, it feels uncomfortable. Hmm. Okay. Um, have you had incidents where you feel your privacy has been compromised? Um, I think there's a lot of scaremongering sometimes about this, and there's a lot of things which where um, things people may feel their privacy has been compromised. Uh, you know, an example we were touching earlier on. Uh, you know, emails saying that your password has been leaked. Being honest, that doesn't feel like that has damaged my privacy in any particular shape or form. Um, where I, you know, data being used in the wrong way and compromising my privacy, um, my personal phone number being called at the weekends by recruiters trying to say, hey, we see you've got jobs advertised. You know, that feels to me like that's impacting my privacy because if my personal phone number is on something, 
I don't expect it to be used in a work setting by recruiters on a Saturday afternoon uh, who've trying to track me down to uh, tell me they've got the best JavaScript engineer ever. And that's a true example. <laughs> okay. But if you land an interesting job, it might be all right uh, if you're in the market <laughs> for it. <laughs> uh, Tommy, how about you? What's your definition of the of the privacy word? Uh, yes. Actually, it's very much the same with Dominic's, right? So privacy is about keeping my personal information uh, any information that I want to keep for myself and that I have control over who I share that data to, right? So just like what Dominic, uh, from his example, right, his picture on LinkedIn, right? So we have control about sharing that photo. We only allow it to be used for LinkedIn purposes and not for other things, right? And that that by itself, by having that control, I think that's what's um the most important thing, right? And the sad part about that, right, is majority of people nowadays doesn't know the repercussion of what they're sharing online, right? Um, they keep on, um, they probably post a lot of pictures um, of, of their vacations and those things have certain um, data tied to those um, uh, photos, for example, right? So again, privacy is about control, about control and about sharing my personal information to those who only I want to share it uh, to or with. Yeah. Mm, and uh, same question as with Dominic uh, earlier. Uh, have you felt that uh, yours has been compromised in any way? Um, not really. Uh, I would say, uh, I, I think Dominic has a good example in terms of uh, uh, recruiters, right? Calling over a weekend, right? Saying there's a good, um, good, uh, job position for for me right so but by weekend you want to rest so you don't want to receive any other calls um non-emergency non-work related calls so i think that by itself yeah invades my privacy yeah okay cool guy over to you what's your definition for privacy so I think it's um, important to differentiate between um, privacy and uh, and uh, anonymity, as everybody uh, as everybody was saying. You know, if you're going to engage with the digital world, you lose a certain amount of you, of anonymity, or at least, to be precise, your device loses a, an amount of uh, uh, of anonymity. So I think it's really important for people to try to understand what the digital data trail is that they is that they leave and then think yeah. about whether they're comfortable with leaving that trail or there's elements of that that they'd like to keep that they'd like to keep more private um most people have no idea about digital digital footprints and about the and, and about the trail and uh, to be honest there's no real reason why an, an an average consumer should know that but there's not much attempt being made to edu uh, to educate them to educate them either so you you should know uh, nobody wants to be ripped off obviously but some of those um some of those uh, breadcrumbs and other digital trails can be helpful to you the, if people know uh, if it helps them to identify interests uh, behavioral context etc it can be useful so people should um understand understand it better than they do it's just not really in any individual's businesses uh interest i suppose to to edu educate about that and in this part of the world we don't have something like uh you know uh, gdpr that, that we have in europe even though there's been a lot of talk about implementing similar things we don't really have that so for me it's educate yourself as to what as to what the trails you're leaving at are and think about whether that matters to you uh, on, on that note uh guy i mean you talk about educating yourself uh how do you go about doing that I mean, how would you know where to find your digital trail, for instance? Well, I think you can start with a very basic step, which is to read the terms and conditions of things that you sign that you sign up for, which the uh, which the majority of people don't do, and I certainly don't. Um, but I think that you really should. Again, there may be nothing about the terms and conditions that you can actually action in any way but you should at least be aware of the potential use the, that you're you're letting a a platform or a device have i mean for example you know um if you if you buy a a smart tv these days um you are probably agreeing to let your voice uh be used 
for uh, research, analysis, development, et cetera, the wording that may, wording may may vary. Now, again, that can produce useful results for you um, in the sense that your device is, you know, I work in advertising, so your device is um, knowing about some product areas you might be interested in can be useful. But you should be aware that that's that, that that's what you're doing, and you should be aware that um, that uh, you know your conversations may not be strictly speaking private. Um, so I think you could, that's a really good place to to start. Read your terms and, and conditions, and think about the platforms that you're using. And a terms and conditions, and B, as I'm sure Tommy and Dominic can talk about more, what they are doing with the data you submit to them. Okay, so. You read the terms and conditions, uh, and if you find something that oh doesn't sit so comfortably with you, uh, you don't accept it, you can't use it, and you do need to use it. For instance, uh, Apple, if you upgrade your iOS or whatever, boom, you get this long list of terms and conditions. You don't up, if you if you don't agree with it and you don't accept it, then it compromises how your device functions with other things, right? So it's there, but seriously, read it or not, you want to use it, you got to use it, right? So at the end of the day, I find the consumer is kind of stuck. It's like, well, you got to, you got to, you want to use it, you got to sign it. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's, it's forced upon you, right? Yeah, Any right. views on that? Yeah. <laughs> Don't think I see you smiling. <laughs> yeah. I just did a quick, quick search in the background while we were talking about this because I think we, you know I'm not picking on Apple other brands are available but I just had a look at the last uh, version of iOS uh, privacy conditions we say just read it it's 573 pages mm -hmm. long true <laughs> <laughs> okay exactly and, right <laughs> and quite legalese as well you know so I think we say let's make sure we read the terms and conditions I just don't think it's practical for anybody, never mind, you know, an average consumer to read the terms and conditions and actually understand what they mean these days. It would probably take a trained lawyer quite a long while to get through that, those decencies and actually understand the implications of what they were uh, setting up for. So I'm not sure you can read the terms and conditions these days as a consumer. And therefore, I don't, you know, it raises the question about whether you can understand if it's possible to understand what it is you're agreeing to. And if you can't understand what you're agreeing to, by my definition of privacy, then maybe you're not getting that privacy. That's to be fair to Apple, I should probably point out, I've just realized that's in quite a lot of languages, so they are somewhat shorter than that. But the point is still <laughs> valid. They're still long <laughs> and complicated. Yes, yes. Tell me with Asset, how long is your uh, agreement for your customers? Oh, good question. Uh, um, in terms of that, uh, probably I would say, I would say it's a couple of pages long. Uh, but not 500 pages. Huh? <laughs> okay. No. So I suppose it's the the profile of the business, right? If uh, you want to reach out to your consumer, then you have to be approachable as well to some extent. Does the consumer have uh, any kind of say in this privacy issue? And if you guys think that he has, he or she has, then what is it that they should do about it? Tommy, your your business deals a lot with these sort of security issues and stuff like yes. that. What what would you recommend? Right. So uh, I would agree with what Guy mentioned about user education, right? So as as all these privacy issues stems from lack of uh, awareness from from the consumer, from the user, right? So empowering the user would would they in terms of how they handle their data, taking control of their own information, I think that would pretty much uh, be useful, right? Um, benefit all the consumers out there. But the problem is, again, um, going back to what Dominic said about the uh, terms and condition, right? It's 500 pages long. So I think it's designed that way to become uh, 500 pages long, to become, uh, to use legally uh, legal terms uh, for the average consumer to not really understand what they're signing up to. It's designed that way. So uh, I was, as Dominic was saying earlier, right, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, probably because we already have like GDPR in place, data protection regulation in place, right? So probably we could demand or we could uh, incorporate additional policies wherein these terms and conditions should be in layman terms, right? Uh, 
for average consumer to really understand what you're signing on to, right? And then from from a cybersecurity company, right, our our goal, our focus is really in terms of protecting or advocate uh, advocating user control over their privacy data. And majority of the solutions being offered enhances the security without really compromising privacy. Yeah. So pri- yeah. um, lacking privacy, that's the last thing that we want yeah. as, as a company. Yeah. In the terms and conditions regarding privacy, what would you say would be key things to, to be mindful of? A further issue, I guess, that there is out there is that um, trying to maintain security, um, and not a specialist like, like Tommy in this, but as a consumer, seems to be increasingly complicated and increasingly an increasingly poor customer exper- uh, customer experience. If you remember when we all first started using um, the internet and uh, and got our fast passwords, you know, we all used the name of our cat. Now we're into into massively complicated um, uh, combinations of numbers and letters, want things that we can't even remember. So we're forced to either write it down or trust Google or whichever other platform to maintain our our security for us. We have to have dual... Um, no, uh, dual token notification, which is great unless you ever lose your phone, in which case you just can't do it anymore. It's the consumer experience is is really is really not particularly good from a security perspective either. So I think from a consumer perspective, you should really try to reward uh, businesses that a make it easy for you to understand what they are and what they are not doing with your data. It's not that hard to describe that in a couple of paragraphs on a, on a website, and some businesses do do that. And, second, and secondly, to make sure that, it's a, that uh, the, the, process is as, um, the process is as clean um, and clear as it possibly can be. I imagine that a lot of nascent businesses the security component of it is a must do, but it doesn't really contribute to your profitability that much. And therefore, you know, it's it's also it's also uh, a cost to do well and properly that doesn't add to your profits yes. particularly. Um, and so, you know, there's an incentive there to do not. I'm not saying every company does this, but there's an incentive to do the minimum. Try to find reward businesses who do a little bit more than the minimum, I think. I couldn't agree more with what um, mm-hmm. Guy just said. I mean, there is a there is a cost um, to do security, and that cost is material and growing over time for businesses. But for many businesses, depending on the type of business it is, there's a much larger cost for not doing the security. Um, and I'm not talking about fines from regulators for data breaches, you know, uh, these are things that can cripple companies, completely cripple companies or destroy companies and put them out of business. Um, and it's a very, very different challenge because the threat landscape out there is forever uh, changing. It's getting harder and faster to keep businesses safe. I think there's a lot of companies which are stuck with a lot of legacy technologies and a lot of legacy systems, and that makes it even harder. But it's one of those areas where you have to put focus on and really make sure that you've got the focus on the privacy of your customers and the point about having clear and sensible terms and conditions um, there, which are readily available and understand because this is an important one. You know, um, I prove a company I work for is based in the UK. As a UK company, we are held under the European GDPR or the UK GDPR now that we've left the European Union. Um, and actually, that's extraterritorial. So what that means is I'm sitting in uh, Malaysia at the moment. For our customers in Malaysia, we have to be GDPR compliant. It doesn't matter that they're a Malaysian customer. And the same is true globally. So we've, had, as a company, have had to take those best practices, if I can put it that way, of GDPR. And GDPR is not uh, perfect by any stretch of your imagination. But I think it's a very good step in the the right direction of protecting people's privacy and uh, apply that globally, not just within uh, Europe where it was originally intended to be so. And there's a question here about uh, password managers. Is it safe to leave that in somebody else's hands? 
I'm just going to comment on the complexity of passwords, if I may, first, actually, because that's an interesting one. And that's actually something that is changing at the moment uh, in the UK for quite a long while. The um, UK National Cyber Security Centre um, has recommended that you do not enforce password changes on people because their view has been for a long while that forcing people to change password actually just makes it far more likely. They'll change a six to a seven at the end and it's more likely to get breached. Um, Interestingly, in the United States, uh, NIST, the National Institute of Science and Technology, who set the identity proofing standards, identity standards for not just the United States, but actually are used globally, um, are actually in the middle of just doing the same, where they are recommending you do not force password complexity requirements of any type in terms of um, special characters, letters, uh, but instead you set a minimum length, ideally quite a long minimum length, uh, and then uh, don't force users to change it. And I think the world is moving in that. In terms of password managers, I actually use a proprietary password manager. Um, I won't name the uh, particular brand because one or two, uh, there are a few out there, but there's a particular one who I personally trust and my, um, I use and our company uses. Um, but I have to say there are one or two passwords for one or two really, really important things, which I just don't write down or save anywhere. They're only in there. How many characters should you have in a password? Um, it's interesting because uh, I think there's very, very different views on this one around the world. I think in the latest yes. version of the NIST standards, they're actually mandating eight, but recommending, I believe, 15 as the minimum minimum length. But, you know, I, one little trick which I use for most of my passwords, and I don't think I'm giving away anything by saying this, is I use memorable passphrases. So yes. I might... Not, I won't use random gibberish, which I can't remember and therefore have to write down. I'll choose a phrase of something I like. I know, uh, like I'm in Malaysia at the moment. So, you know, Malaysia, great food 2024 and use that as a password or something there, a series of words which mean something to me, but are extremely unlikely for somebody else uh, to um, guess. Hmm. I suppose sticking a, an odd character in there would be helpful, a special character, for instance. Uh, if you was in Malaysia, I would put M in the, the at sign for, for A, you know. So I suppose that kind of disrupts it a bit, maybe, or does it? I don't know. AI, I'm sure, is figuring all of that out as well, right? For, so for the, for, for the hackers out there, uh, they're probably having a, a great time with AI mm -hmm. to try and That's bust awesome. whatever is taking place in the legal world to get an access to it. So... Uh, this this race between uh, you know the people trying to implement security measures and those trying to 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 break it down, uh, how is that progressing, uh, Tommy? Do you do you find that uh, it's becoming more and more difficult, or is more challenging for for asset, for instance, to to keep pace, to continuously uh, have to be on top of things? What does it take? Right. Right. So actually, you made a good point in terms of the threat actors using AI as well as a form of, from your example, um, cracking passwords, right? But in terms of um, cybersecurity company, right, we could also make use of those tools available for the bad guys in terms of creating um, algorithms that would uh, strengthen security. For example, right? So uh, algorithms that would be essential in terms of um, analyzing large quantities of data sets, right? As you guys know, there's a lot of um, uh, malware variants being created on a daily basis, and it's really impossible to do it on a human level, right? Analyzing all those samples uh, on a daily basis, the large volume of data. And really, the tools would really be useful in terms of classifying them and then focusing on those that are highly critical ones, right? So what I'm saying is um, uh, the tools are actually needed, right? But at the end of the day, the expertise is also what makes those tools work, right? Without you fine-tuning those tools, without you um, tweaking them, uh, without you modifying them as, as we go along, as it uh, analyzes large quantities of data, it wouldn't be that effective, right? Uh, there would be a lot of false positives, a lot of uh, wrong detections, for example, right? That would uh, result from not having that um, human side of things rather than just the tools itself. Dominic, there's a question here about uh, biometrics. Um, 
is that the way to go to address the consumer difficulties of complex passwords? Uh, or is yeah. that a riskier proposition from a privacy standpoint? Uh, sure. This is your area, right? The biometrics. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, for those that don't know, uh, iProof basically provides biometric solutions uh, to governments and uh, industry around the world, um, both for onboarding, but also for exactly that, for password replacement for particular use cases. So, for example, we have uh, banks that use us as a uh, factor if you need to re-onboard your banking application onto the phone or if you're making a payment which they consider as risky. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is differentiate quickly between on-device biometrics, um, such as you know me using my fingerprint to un uh, unlock my phone, and actually um, uh, cloud-based biometrics, such as those that we sell. They both have a place, in, but they're very, very different than each other and have different um, challenges, which I sometimes don't feel are understood. Device biometrics, in terms of security, aren't really a biometric which may sound strange, because although I've just used my fingerprint to unlock my phone, but the, the banking application may know I've just authenticated using my fingerprint or a biometric on the phone, my fingerprint on my face, but it doesn't know who authenticated. I found this one out the hard way when my daughter was about 13, when I suddenly discovered she'd had her fingerprint enrolled on my phone for the previous 18 months as a convenient way for her to unlock it. So for those 18 months, every single time I authenticated to the phone or to an application on the phone, that application, that company had no way to know if it was me or her. So on device biometrics really are only proof of knowledge of the PIN number of the phone, because if you can unlock the phone, you can add your own biometric as a biometric to it. From a privacy perspective, if I talk about cloud biometrics, you know, a question I often get asked is what happens if my biometric is stolen? You know, I can't change my face if my face biometric is stolen. And this is the question we regularly get asked. And I'm going to suggest it's maybe the wrong question because my face is public. It's on my LinkedIn. It's on my Twitter. Uh, it's on my it's on this web chat. You know, it's on this call. So you can get a copy of my face from this call. And you don't need to steal a biometric. You can download a open source face matcher off GitHub and you can create a biometric of my face. So we have to all understand that our biometrics are widely available to everybody, particularly our face biometric is available to anybody who wants it. So this, what matters here is not do people have my bi biometric, it's when I'm using it, is it really me who's using it? So you've got to be able to tell that actually it is a real face and a real human being that's making use of it, uh, not uh, actually just a copy of it, like a high quality photo or a digital image. So right. I, I don't worry about the privacy of my biometrics. Indeed, when I get challenged on it, what I sometimes do is I email people a copy of my biometrics and say, here you go. It's not private. Now you've got it. What are you going to do with it? One risk you've got is they can, of course, be abused, you know, so in surveillance, for example, I used the example of uh, putting my face on a social media site uh, and then it being used for a completely unexpected process. To be fair, you know, that's not a risk of using biometrics for a particular use case. If I'm willing to put my, a photo of my face out there, then that can happen in anywhere independently of it. So my personal view is for areas where you really need to know who you're dealing with. So a very, very high risk scenario, granted privilege access to a system administrator in the middle of the night, rebinding a end user of a bank to their phone so that they can transfer some money or opening an account which would allow money laundering. Biometrics are a very good answer to part of the problem, but they must always be part of a bigger solution. What would the bigger solution be? What would be a holistic solution for, for these sort of situations? Um, you know, it's wider than this, but there are very, very strong security solutions out there in terms of, you know, ensuring the uh, device, you know, the use of pass keys, for example, uh, which is starting to be more and more widespread, is a strong solution. But what it is doing at the end of the day is proving possession of a device. So biometric is one method when you really need to know you've got the right person. If a level of security is that you need to know, for example, that, that you need is you need to know that somebody has possession of a device, then that is absolutely 
hope, you know, the right thing to do is to use something that makes the user experience as good as you can. I really do hope that we're starting to see the, not the end of passwords, because I don't believe that is the case, but we'll start to, starting to move away from where you have to be using your password on a regular, regular basis. Being able to assert your identity perhaps using verifiable credentials, perhaps using a pass key, perhaps using some other technology, and then being able to prove it's you that's doing that assertion by using biometrics, I think is the way forward. Because that gives you, you've absolutely got user experience there where they're not having to remember complicated things and do complicated things, but actually you've got a stronger security and we need to move away from this area where we're all getting these emails because yet another site has leaked out password, which at least hopefully they've uh, uh, hashed and sorted so it doesn't matter so much. But again, you know, it shouldn't matter if that happens. I should, those companies, the companies should have the responsibility of looking after me as a consumer rather than putting the um, weight on the consumer to protect their password and use different passwords. You know, this has to be the industry's problem, not the consumer's problem. In the case of breaches, for instance, right, uh, when we're talking about uh, the, the, the carousel was fined 58,000 for two data breaches, uh, one involving 2.6 million customers. Um, DBS and Citibank had an outage uh, in October. And the, the, the victim here is the consumer because they couldn't transact certain things, they couldn't get things done. Uh, there's a fine imposed uh, and that's paid to the authorities. Uh, what's the benefit for the consumer and all of this? I mean, if you are essentially the, the, the reason why these things exist, but when something goes wrong, you're out of the picture. Is, is there a better way of doing this so that also the consumer can look at it and say, okay, if this is going to happen, then there's going to be some payout because, hey, you use my stuff, you didn't take care of my stuff, and you have to pay for it rather than, you know, it just being at a higher level transaction and I'm just left uh, left in the lurch here with nothing. That's right. There are standard uh, <clears throat> legislative legislated remedies for things like when your flights get delayed, your flights get cancelled, your luggage gets lost. These sort of these sort of things, right? I really do think you know getting similar consumer remedies for these sort of breaches has to be has to be legislated. I don't know yes. that there is anything that an individual consumer can do other than remove their trade i mean i don't know that there's anything more anything more particularly they can do are consumers demanding that uh that they get compensated for data breaches no whenever somebody whenever a flight just to use that example right whenever a flight gets cancelled we see lots of images of stranded people in airports and 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 people angry and upset un understandably right so there becomes pressure from the public is there the same pressure about about, about a carousel a carousel breach? Not really, because although it's inconvenient for me that I can't use carousel for a little while, do I really think I've been hurt? Maybe, maybe not. So, it's it's down to consumer pressure to drive legislation. Where do you see the privacy issues uh, headed in the future? I mean, in the next five to ten years, do you see? Any uh, advancements in certain areas that would improve that sense of privacy for both business and uh, individuals? Or do you see it sort of continuing in this vein? I think there's very much a trend to put um, data in the control of the citizen to allow them to choose what they do with it. Again, if I refer back to Europe, for example, the European Union has mandated um, that all European citizens will have a wallet on their phone and every every uh, member state of the European Union must supply a digital identity to which can run in that wallet, which will suddenly mean that people are walking around with a digital version of their identity documents. And it can be many things apart from their uh, identity documents, many attributes such as proofs of education or proofs of actually anything else. But to make that effective, the organisations which you want to authenticate to have to accept that. So again, the European Union has actually mandated that. So what that means is in a few years' time, Amazon, Facebook, and all the others will have to accept those as a method of authentication to log onto their platform. And I think that's very powerful. But what it does do is it starts to put a lot of convenience in the way it works in, in the uh, uh, 
um, consumers. So if your user experience of that is really, really good, the it starts to put the data being held by the end user, by the consumer. There's no real requirement for platforms to hold that. So it'd be interesting in the privacy policies to see which choose to keep a copy of it anyway and which don't. They ask you to prove who you are and then get rid of it because they no longer need it. And that's really, for me, one of the things I look for in if I read privacy policies, and I actually do read rather a lot of privacy policies, is to see how many, uh, how long people are keeping your data for. And it's very varied. And then lastly, though, it's actually starting to move the identity to the handset. Because again, if you use that set, it's not actually proving it's me. It's proving who is the person who, the, the person who's got possession of that handset and access to that handset at that moment in time. And, you know, there's a problem there that's being worked on at the moment called binding, which is, you know, binding the real person um, to that identity so you can make use of it. Um, the only way to do that is biometrics. There is no other way to do that apart from in a person, which, you know, just does not scale. So I think there's going to be a very strong trend towards distributed identity for this. And I very much hope that will bring a uh, bring us much stronger authentication into platforms which, you know, and move away from passwords and move away from SMS and other methods which just really have had their day a long while ago. So I'm quite hopeful for the future. I'm very sure it'll bring some new problems we haven't foreseen yet too. And, you know, it's trying to work out what those are and to manage those the best we as an we, you know, as the people responsible for running these systems, as an industry, we need to be really on top of this and try to think this through as well as we can. So it's not only the consumer's um, responsibility, right? Uh, regulation, legislation plays a huge role in, in terms of keeping our data private, right? Um, uh, as as you might guys have known this uh, right, if the product is free, right, you are the product. So it's it's really important in what information we're trying to put out out there, and um, the laws and regulations are the backbone of um, accountability for this large organizations that an- handles our data, right? And I do believe for the future, right. I'm also hopeful in terms of um, new innovations in terms of technology. Uh, right now, um, majority of um, uh, pr- solutions that are being rolled out, um, they incorporated this what we call secure by design. They're thinking firsthand the security um, of the whole system, and as they build the application or the system itself. Right, so I'm really hopeful in terms of that. I'm um, I'm slightly worried about a um, a, 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 a bit of a different ele- uh, aspect than we've discussed today. I I worry a bit about um, uh, can the people being um, incentivized to uh, give up elements of privacy, or rather penalize if they refuse to do it. For example, if you are a health uh, insurance provider, you might ask me potentially to wear some sort of a device or a tracker or chip that helps them to monitor my uh, health signals. You can give me a big incentive to do that financially. You can give me a, uh, a, a, a the opposite of an incentive, a disincentive, not to financial disincentive, not to do, to do that. I agree that actuarial tables, you know, do this to a this type of discrimination to a certain extent, but I worry about that element of privacy more than I worry mainly of that somebody in the internet is going to rip me off. I don't worry much about that, but I do worry about a future where that sort of data, uh, release of data privacy is a kind of mandatory to interact okay. with health insurers and others. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, what, what do you think of uh, things like uh, mm. VPN, and uh, you know instruments like that to sort of manage the whole privacy aspect uh, of your use of uh, devices. Uh, do you think they they help or they are mm, may may not be of much use? Um, I actually have quite strong views on this one. I mean, I think there's a lot of companies selling VPN solutions to people who actually think they're getting a lot more privacy from that. Uh, than they actually are getting. I mean, VPNs will allow me to change my IP address so that, you know, I appear to be, uh, you know, people can't geolocate my IP address. 
but um, they're not giving you a lot more than that. We use VPNs for work purposes, where it's got a completely different reason. VPN in privacy, I think there's a lot of thing, lot of money being made selling VPNs to people who don't, who think they're getting a lot more for it than they are. So that's my view on it. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, why don't you think there's uh, enough privacy in VPN? Or um, privacy? It's cuffing. I think because it, what it is fundamentally doing is hiding your IP address and no more than that. I certainly know, personally know people who've bought it and thought by that they were no longer being tracked in terms of advertising while still you know, maybe authenticating with Google or Facebook or something else to the sites they're at. And somehow, you know, then you're not getting the privacy where people don't have your email address or don't be able to have the cookies on to track you and track you around the internet by having a VPN. And I think there's quite a lot of confusion about what you are getting and what you're not getting from a VPN service. You know, I'm not saying they're useless. They're not. I use one, I pay for one personally, and I use it some of the time. But uh, I, it's not a answer to all evil, um, which yes. sometimes they seem to be, some people believe they are or suggest they are. Yes. There's always new evil coming up anyway. <laughs> yes. New new methods to get at you. Uh, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for all the, 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 the insights about uh, this topic of uh, uh, privacy. I don't know uh, whether it's uh, you know it's it covers as many bases as you'd like. It's a it's a it's a big it's a big topic. It goes in many directions. It's uh, very layered as well. So it's, uh, but I think uh, some aspects of what we've discussed are important uh, to bear in mind. Um, you know, you've got to be a bit more careful about how you deal with uh, with things. Um, yes. You may want to consider what uh, you put out there uh, in the public domain. Uh, I think one, two, three, four, before you decide to uh, press the go button. Uh, other than that, I suppose, you know, a lot of people don't care. I mean, you walk along the streets, the cameras everywhere, you're being watched, you're being followed, uh, they can see you. I, I remember there was this uh, article about uh, a lady in Australia who was wearing a seatbelt incorrectly. She was wearing it under her arm as, or, instead of over her shoulder. And a camera caught her and they sent the fine to her, uh, to the driver who was a partner, I think, in Singapore. And he got uh, some hefty fine and, and whatnot. So they were. She was amazed that wow, they managed to recognize me. So I guess it's very hard to dodge this uh, these cameras these days. Uh, they take very good pictures. Um, so you're being watched, and I think that's going to be the way the world is, right? If, uh, everybody knows what you're doing, where you're going, what you're what's mm -hmm. happening. Um, so this this issue of privacy is is moved into a different direction. Uh, it could mean other things uh, become more private. And things that you once considered private are no longer private. It's a sign of the times. So you got to go with the flow, right? Mm -hmm.